Oh. Would you, we're live? Okay, hey, mom and Mac. Mac, we're live now. So we're, they're gonna pick up all of your. Good morning, saints. God bless you and welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is alive. Christ is risen. To which you would reply, and I can possibly hear you if I tune my ear loud enough, he is risen indeed. As the Greeks would say, Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. And he is risen indeed. So we are thankful this morning to come into your home. Last year, we were in our homes, literally, broadcasting live from our living rooms, tuning in together. And while it's been a whole year, we're slowly returning to normal. There's a couple of us in the sanctuary today. We're thankful to be able to join you this morning, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. We hope and trust and pray that this morning greets you with the joy it brings, the sense of hope it renews in each and every one of you. We're going to sing Christ the Lord is Risen today, number 367, and I think it sets the tone for our service today. So won't you sing out aloud? Maybe you just know the chorus, and that's all right. I will try to share the words with you, and you may pick up a stanza here and there, but join us and sing this song with us together. Christ the Lord is in two i 
Just a couple of verses. We're going to ask you to sing along with us. Hold you down. No, 
And that is our anthem. We are grateful today that you're joining us. Welcome. Come on in. Invite a friend. Hit the share button. Hit the like button. And share our service with your friends and loved ones. Isaiah 53 says this, and I want to draw it to your attention just for a second before we enter and begin with the word of prayer. The Bible says, surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, make it personal, earnest transgressions. He was crushed. For our iniquities, make it personal, earnest iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. For those of you that may not know, this text is talking about Jesus. And we're grateful today that the fulfillment of Isaiah 53 was carried out on Calvary's hill. But death couldn't hold him down, and he's alive and well. The word of the Lord for the people of God, would you Pray with me. Our God and our Father in heaven, we commit this service to you and we thank you for those who have tuned in and those who are with us. We have new hope. We have new life in Jesus on account of his resurrection from among the dead. Oh God, we are thankful this morning. And we commit this service to you now in the mighty name of Jesus that you do what you see fit, oh God. Have your way in our hearts and in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Delario is coming to take us further. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here on this Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Sometimes we feel like we can't make it. We can't make it. That's true. We can't make it on our own. But if we put our hope and trust in our Lord and Savior, who my goodness, on a, on a good Friday evening, <laughs> my goodness, sacrifice his life for me. Again, make it personal. Make it personal. Sacrifice his life. Good Friday. Darkness. Can you imagine darkness over the face of the earth during that hour that he released his spirit back up to his father? And then, hallelujah, hallelujah, Glory. my goodness, Glory. we came through, we, he came through to that Sunday morning yes, when I'm young preaching women went out to the grave and they saw an empty grave, nothing there, look at this. Had time to fold his clothes up. Yeah. It's in the scripture. Folded his clothes up nice and I'm done with this. Yeah. He wasn't out of there in a hurry. He had time to fold them up and, and lay them there. And he was gone. That was it. Hallelujah. We praise our God for giving us his son as the redemption, the, the sacrificial lamb. My God. Hallelujah. Couldn't have been done without it. So we praise him this morning for what he did for me, <laughs> for me. Well, again, thank you all for being with us this morning. If you're here, we do have a few people here with us this morning. It's not too late to come down. So get in your car and come on down. Bring your mask, your hand sanitizer, and worship here in the sanctuary with us. But it's... Two, you can stay at home. We thank the Lord for this technology that allows us to come into your home via something as simple as a, as, a, as a cell phone. You can see us now live. So whichever way you prefer, we're glad to have you. By way of announcements, uh, we did announce to you last week 
that the uh, football team, those young fellas that were using our building, had to forfeit their season. They didn't have enough players. Illinois, what is it? Uh, CPS, yeah. They, they said they didn't have enough young men. So that shut that whole thing down. But as a church, I don't want us to turn our back on them. Uh, Pastor Ernest and I have been in conversation with them, in fact, to do something to encourage them as a church. So we will continue to let you know as that progresses and that grows. We just want them to know that we are here. And if that involves buying some pizza for them one evening and, and, and inviting them back to the church and having a word, share the word with them and just loving on them for a little while, we'll do that. Or some other kind of display of love towards them. I want to welcome some of our out of town regulars. I know uh, Dan and Michelle Fogelson who have been joining us in the Bible study are probably out there and welcome in Albert Knox, one of a, another one of our previous members who has been tuning in, joining in, in the Bible study. Uh, we just want to welcome you and whoever else First-timers, Mary Ann Bell, that's right, <laughs> all the way from the West Coast. We welcome her also. So many others are out there. I couldn't name them all, but we thank the Lord again for this technology that allows us to do that. <clears throat> I'm going to ask that you all uh, continue to pray for Pastor Ernest, who has uh, been considering doing a reboot of a, a podcast okay yeah so uh we will again get that information out to you but he found that to be uh an excellent way to address issues pertinent issues over the airwaves so let's be praying with him that the lord would open up that door uh, <clears throat> be praying with our sister rita and the uh, Rupert Jones family, I believe it was Rupert Jones who passed away last week. But let's continue to pray for that family. And I mentioned Albert once. Albert mentioned to me that uh, he would ask that the church be praying for his youngest son, Jeremiah, who has <clears throat> been in a, well, he's, he's homeless, actually. No other way to say it. He's homeless. And just going through some issues as a, as a homeless young man, some <clears throat> serious issues that need to be, be addressed in therapy. So let's be praying for Jeremiah. Uh, thank the Lord for Iris returning home from the hospital. Got an opportunity to speak to her just yesterday. She's doing better, uh, learning to adjust to a new life that she has to do dialysis three times a week. So she'll be there for three hours, three times a week. And uh, she says she's trying to figure out what to do with her time there. You know, you go in, I understand that when I do an infusion and I go in, every several weeks and, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do with this time and, and you figure you're going to read, you know, you're going to get caught up in your studies in the word, but most times, you know what you do? You fall asleep. <laughs> you fall asleep. So let's be praying with her as she adjusts her schedule. This is her life now and how she can be productive. And I know that's what she wants to do as she's there doing that uh, dialysis. I don't have my phone up. If anybody else, do go ahead and post a prayer request in the chat line that's available to you. If I don't get a, to see them just right away, uh, the others who are right now looking at the stream get a chance to see it, and they could be praying for you. Don't have to be me alone praying. Let's pray for each other. Let's hold each other up, and that's what this is all about can't think of anything else right now. Uh, Sister Dorothy, anything to announce? No? 
there will be an upcoming meeting to discuss an opportunity regarding the uh, uh, land that we have fenced on the north side of the Maypole. We will we, uh, <clears throat> possibly we've been we've been approached several times by an organization that wants to do some urban farming. So it would be a way to make that land useful as it's, it's sitting there right now. Uh, and we need to decide as a church if we want to allow them to do that. So be praying about that with us as leadership. And we go forward with that. Brother Ola, it's good to see you. Is uh, Sister Deborah okay? Oh, good. She is here. Praise the Lord. Deborah, who keeps us going? Our church administrator. Okay, I'd like for you to uh, bow with me now as we enter before the throne of grace to obtain some of that mercy that we do need. To obtain some mercy. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you, we praise you, and we look to you as our help. Psalmist said, I look to the hills from which cometh my help. We know that our help comes from you the maker of heaven and earth. So we bow before you, giving you all the praise due you. Father, if, if, if we stayed on our knees the rest of our life, that's not enough honor that you deserve. So we lift it up now, Lord, loudly proclaiming that we love you, loudly proclaiming that you are God of gods, King of kings, El Elyon, the most high God. No one, no one, no thing is above you. Everything is beneath you, Lord, including us. So, Father, we hold you up and we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness. Lord, for, for taking us from one day to the next. Taking us, Lord, not, in, not only from day to day, but, Lord, from hour to hour. Nothing is promised, Lord. Time isn't promised to us. You, you are the only eternal being. You are the one who holds time in your hand. It's us, Lord, who constantly look at our watches, who constantly determining what to do with our time. Help us to know what you want us to do with that, how to be a blessing towards others and how to bring you glory. We thank you, Lord, for this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Lord, that because of the death of your son, we don't owe that, that, that price, which would have been our death. We don't owe it. You atoned for it. Hmm. On our, our foreheads or on our hand, it, it says acquitted. And we thank you, God, that we have been set free from that, from that, that fate. Come before you, Lord, on behalf of our sister Iris, who has come out of the hospital. First, we want to thank and praise you for that. And Father, we also want to stay before you on her behalf as she has to adjust to dialysis and all of what that means. You know better than, than any of us the medical issue and how the, the blood needs to be cleansed. <laughs> My goodness, look at that. You cleansed us. Iris needs you to do that for her here in this physical realm. Keep that thing going. May she learn to adjust and be obedient to the dietary requirements that she has to adjust to for the rest of her life. Father, we hold up. Brother Mac and Joan's granddaughter, Marin, who's faced with a, another surgery. God, we ask that you would continue to comfort her and speak to her to let her know that you are walking this road with her. She's not alone. She does not have to face this surgery by herself, but your spirit will be with her to take her into surgery and to bring her out. Father, we pray for that entire family, <clears throat> for Kirsten and David as they uh, walk with their daughter during this time. 
We pray also for Brother Malcolm as he's about to hit the road once again to visit some college students. Lord, this week he's looking to go to Illinois State and then on to U of I. Pray for that time even now that you would bring out those students who he should have those personal interactions with. May you be glorified in those interactions. May the students draw encouragement from the visit and time with Mac. Father, we pray for traveling mercies as he's out on the road, going to and from these two uh, universities. <clears throat> I want to pray also for one of our personal friends, Marie Yonkers, and her son-in-laws, Lord, she often brings them up in Bible study. I want to pray particularly for uh, Mike, who's been looking for a job over a year now. It's a long time to be without a job, but Lord, it shows your faithfulness to that family, how you continue to provide <clears throat> over a year without having gainful <clears throat> employment. We thank you for taking care of the family. Father, we thank you for keeping them safe. We thank you, Lord, for providing for their needs, just like you've provided for all of our needs. It's just a blessing to be before you today. God, we also pray for just Sister Rita. I know she's been having some, some aches and pains so we hold her up before you this morning also, asking that you would minister to her body as we are all aging and becoming more familiar with what that means in the body. Encourage her. We thank you, Lord, for her ministry throughout the years here at Keystone. It's been a blessing to us. Father, so many things to be grateful for. So many things to be grateful for. So we pause again to, to acknowledge that all of our blessings come from you. We ask your blessing over this service today. Be with Pastor as he brings the word today. Use him as a vehicle, Lord, to speak your word. May it be, as you say, sharper than a two-edged sword, that it might cut and divide between joint <clears throat> and soul, uh, bone and marrow. <clears throat> Thank you again for this day. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> oh, okay. <clears throat> Asking Sister Gilbert, mm -hmm. Sister Gilbert, would you come forward? We're looking for your uh, ministry gift again today. 358. It's in the songbook, 358. Because he lives. Oh, yes. Would you join us there? Hymn number 358. Come on. Just to lead the song. Mm-hmm. We you sing it with you. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Won't you stand up? God sent his son. Thank you. 
be seated. He's alive. Christ is risen. I love that response. I never, I never tire. I never, it never gets old. It, it never is played out. It is an affirmation that you ought to proclaim every single day. No matter what you're facing, when you wake up in the morning, he's alive. Therefore, everything is cared for. And everything's going to be all right. He's alive and well, saints. An empty tomb, an empty grave is there to declare that he's no longer dead. Death has no victory over him, Brother Otis. We're gathered this morning to celebrate anew some 2,000 years beyond the verifiable act of Jesus' literal and bodily resurrection. We're here. This is the Super Bowl for the Christian. This is the most important day on the calendar. As a matter of fact, we, we like to joke around and say that, you know, we ought to celebrate the birth of Jesus every day. His birth is something that we never lose sight of. Well, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus should not be lost sight of either. So we're here today to do that. And we're slowly but surely, slowly but surely, returning to normal. A couple, two things I want to just reflect upon with you this morning. Amen. Amen. We are thanking God for a soft opening. If you want to come down, you can. We are distant and sitting at different places throughout the sanctuary, distant with our masks. And you can come in, you can participate, but we're not officially open because we want to make a big stink about it, right, Matt? We want to make a big (laughs) we want to make a big deal about our re-entry into this place. But if you feel led, if you, you know, I've been I've been vaccinated twice, and some of you have some of us here have been vaccinated twice. And there's a sense of reassurance by that. But if you feel comfortable and if you have taken your precautions and you want to come, you can. So we thank you for that. Another thing is, thank you for your ongoing constant support. You have given of your own all year long. You can continue to do so online, in person, or through the mail. Online, of course, is always at keystonebaptist.church at yahoo.com. I'll say it again. You can send it through Zale at keystonebaptist.church at yahoo.com. We're on the move, saints. We've made progress in many ways. When you walk in this place, you may not recognize certain things. We've made changes to our building to enhance its safety. We've made changes to our building to enhance our media. We're making changes all the time in order to prepare for what God is calling us to. So be, so be praying. Pastor Delario and I are just ecstatic to see what God is doing. And not just aesthetic changes to the building, but expanding our reach too. Well, good is a building if it has no occupants. All right. All right. <laughs> You'll get that. Some of you. Well, good is a building if it has no occupants and people to utilize this beautiful space. I'm done sharing. It is an important thing. I want to get to the word. So won't you pray with me? Father, you're wonderful. My God, you are wonderful. Today, we have great joy. We may have faced incredible challenges all week long. We have been bombarded by bad news all the time. But God, we we know the difference between looking at our world and looking at it without hope. We have hope because Jesus has been resurrected from among the dead. And God, we come this morning to proclaim your living forevermore. We will follow you one day. We will be with you forever. Because you have set, you have paved the way for us to access eternity. We thank you this morning for those that are both viewing and those that are in person. For those that have gathered and those that are gathered around the screen. And Father, I pray that you would be with me this morning. An empty tomb proclaims itself, but there are words in scripture that, 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 could, that I will elaborate upon in a few moments. Would you give me help, please? 
Would you provide me with a reasonable portion of your strength? Anoint these words. Use them, Father, to reach into the hearts and minds of those in attendance and those listening so that, God, you may save somebody. Today would be a great day for salvation. Today would be a wonderful day to receive Jesus Christ. So we commit this time to you now. I ask that you stand in my body, think with my mind, and utilize my speech to render me an oracle for Jesus Christ, that I may tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth regarding you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This past Friday, we gathered a small number of us to celebrate or to commemorate the death of Jesus. I revealed where paradise can be found. It is found in Jesus Christ. It is found in trusting him and gazing upon him in faith. This morning is three days later beyond that day. We gathered this day three days after that fateful afternoon when Jesus paid a penalty he never owed. He paid it for you. He paid it for me. We are here on the other side of Calvary now. <laughs> we're on the other side of Calvary, and we're here this morning in order to celebrate the empty tomb. So that is reason for us to celebrate, and I would that you pray with me now. If, you've, if, you've, if you have ever studied law, you probably know that a person must be tried and found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt before he or she can be convicted of a crime. You might have heard it at the introduction of the most recent high profile case on, online right now. Reasonable doubt. What you may not realize exactly, however, is what's required to prove guilt. What constitutes reasonable doubt? To put it simply, the evidence must be so convincing that no reasonable person would ever question the defendant's guilt. It is not enough to believe he or she is guilty or to think the person is probably committed an offense. It does not mean, however, that the prosecution must eliminate all doubt. Rather, it means that after all the facts have been considered, the logical conclusion must be that the person is indeed guilty. Some unreasonable, unreasonable doubt may still exist. There was a man in the scriptures, or one of the 12, who was notorious for doubting. They called him Didymus. His name meant twin. And on the other side of Calvary, this particular disciple, like many of the others, was fearing for his life. They had a legitimate fear that the thing that happened to Jesus could happen to them. They were in hiding. They were fearful that the authorities would go and snatch them up and gather them too and place them on a cross as well. Thomas, one of the twelve, didn't need much encouragement to doubt. It was what he did naturally. <laughs> he did it early on in his life. We find it also in the book of John. Earlier in chapter 6, we see him unsure about what caused the death of Lazarus. He wasn't sure about that. He thought it would be a good idea to join Lazarus in death. That was earlier on in the Gospel of John. Another, in another instance, poor Thomas struggled to wrap his mind around the knowability of God. God can't be known. How could you know God? I doubt you can know God. He struggled. As a matter of fact, I like Thomas. I like Thomas because I have my own doubts. Maybe you do too. Maybe, maybe you have your own doubts that you struggle with as well. In his mind, God is hidden from us and knowing him is an exercise of futility. How can you, quote unquote, really know God? Can you really know God? Needless to say, Thomas was a candidate for a new way to look at life and his savior. 
Days after the resurrection, he doubted the disciples' testimony because he was, he was prone to doubt. Needless to say, he did, a, he did learn a very valuable lesson, however. It was that faith exercised apart from miracles is applauded from Jesus. And that, that Thomas could put doubt to death after seeing the resurrected Messiah. If you have your Bibles, won't you turn with me to John chapter 20 and the latter part of chapter 20, verse 24. We'll get there in a moment. Put your finger there as I continue to ask you a few questions. If you've ever struggled with doubt, perhaps you've doubted your ability to discern God's love for you. If that's who you are today, if you've ever questioned who God is and his absolute crazy, reckless love that he has for you, then this message is for you as well. On this side of Calvary, John teaches us a very valuable lesson through the disciple Thomas in order to prove the veracity of Jesus' resurrection and to put to bed any notions of the contrary. John chapter 20, verse 24 says this. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, twin, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though all the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Re reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said to him, because you've seen me, <laughs> you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. I'd like to tag this text beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. A faith exhibited without the miraculous is what Jesus applauds. He loves everyday believers who, apart from seeing him, put their faith in him. And this morning... I want to challenge you to put your faith in the, in the truth of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. When we think about our time and our text today, it invites us to, number one, relinquish our reluctance to let go of our doubt. Over the last 400 years, human beings have sought to an excuse to not believe in God. In my study, I've seen it. I've seen that over the last so four, 400, 500 years or so, human beings have felt as though they are graduating from this book, that they are beyond the truth contained therein. And then and, and over this, this particular time period, many would suggest that they just don't see God working in their world, or perhaps they pose the perennial question of which we have always asked, if God exists, why does he allow evil? If God exists, why did he allow a pandemic? If God exists, why is George Floyd dead, Tamir Rice dead, Eric Garner dead? Why, why is it that wars break out in Syria? Why is it, God, that you allow evil things to happen? That's their convenient excuse to say he doesn't exist. Questions like these continue to arise in our day, perhaps even more, in the wake of catastrophic devastation, mass killings that happen every week. Suicide bombings, drug war shootouts, gang wars, senseless killings in K-Town. People, how can God be good when he allows things like this to happen? They say, I didn't come here to talk about this, so, so breathe a sigh of relief. Suffice it to say that God allows evil and unconscionable things to happen every day, and it does not diminish his goodness. 
They're not in the slightest bit. I say all this because if there was a person who embodied a spirit of skepticism, who, if he were alive today, would fit right in with our society, it would be Thomas. Thomas, who we have interacted with on two occasions in chapter 11, verse 25, and in chapter 14, verse 6, shows us what it is like to lack a deep, no-holds-barred faith in Jesus. That's saying a lot because consider who he is. He was one who could have written the song here, and he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow ways. He walked with Jesus. He talked with him. He dapped Jesus. He ate food with Jesus. He saw Jesus give sight to blind folk. He saw Jesus raise the dead. He's seen the experiences of Jesus firsthand. And if anyone was supposed to have a rock solid faith in Christ, it should have been him, right? What Thomas shows us is that you can have an encounter with God that goes unexplainable. You might have survived a crash that others can't comprehend how you did. You might have been cured from cancer without any explanation at all. You may have been exonerated from a charge that you knew was aimed to put you in jail for the rest of your life. You might have been on the receiving end of the most unexplainable yet unmistakable kindness of a God, and it is possible that you still need further proof that God is able to do the impossible. You're from Missouri. You're from the show me state. He's gone the extra mile to prove his love for you. Come back from the dead to ensure that one day you and I too will be with him. I say more than enough to overturn your pessimism. This text is tailored to teach us to release your reluctance. Thomas called Denimus, one of the 12, came and said, we've seen the Lord. He said, unless I see. Can't you hear him? I don't know about all that. I don't know about all that. You can see him with that side eye. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> Unless I put my, see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I won't believe. We may look at Thomas and decide that he is Unique, but there's many Thomases that live among us. They might actually, they actually go to church at Keystone. They, they're here, they're among us. But what this text is tailored to teach us is to relinquish our reluctance. Relinquish our reluctance. Let go of doubt, saint. Let, let it go. He's alive. And you don't always, we have not the privilege of walking with Jesus hand in hand. We, we were not with him. But sometimes even walking with him is not enough. You've got to be relinquished. You've got to let it go. You've got to believe the Lord Jesus. That's the first point. The second point is this. Allow your faith to overcome its limitations. Allow your faith to overcome its limitations. Thomas's faith was stymied by a lack of evidence. He, he fits into this last 400 years is because we live in a world where evidence is what counts, right? If I can't taste it, if I can't touch it, see it, smell it, feel it, it must not happen. That's the world we live in. That's the result of the enlightenment. That's the result of what happens when mankind decides that he's grown now. I'm grown now. I don't need nobody. I don't need this churchy thing. I don't need religion. It's too mm, basic. We're living in that world, and if you have not seen it, then you're not paying attention. But your faith has to overcome its limitations. Listen to verse 26. A week later, Jesus keeps showing up on the scene. This post-resurrection activity is he, he leads a busy schedule after the grave. <laughs> a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came, stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger right here. 
see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. Powerful words spoken to you and me. You and I, like Thomas, have a choice. It's fairly clear and black and white. I was sharing with my wife not long ago that there are only two responses to Jesus in light of what he, the Bible says he did. He's either a lunatic or he's Lord. It's that simple. You can't believe he's Lord on Saturday, on Sunday, and then live like he's just another person Monday through Saturday. Or Sunday, you know what I'm, I think I said that wrong. All right. Many people can rationalize themselves out of anything these days. You, you can reason yourself out of any decision you have to make. But when it comes to Jesus, you and I are forced to make a choice. Either he's God or he's not. Thomas struggled to come to grips with the truth of his resurrection, and perhaps you have too. You've kept up the facade all these years, maintained your Christian ease. You know the right words to say when to say them. But behind closed doors and when nobody is looking, you don't know. You're not sure. You're uncertain if a man named Jesus came back from the dead because you haven't seen that in your world. I'm not talking about resuscitation either. Jesus wasn't just in a coma. Or seeing someone come back with the use of automated external defibrillator, you know, the AEDs that people pound the chest and people shock back to life. I'm not talking about that either. Or seeing some, uh, you're, you're not sure if you can accept it all. You haven't seen God part the sky and speak to you in an audible voice. You haven't seen him intervene in your life in a long time. You wonder if he even cares. You need something. You need some proof. You need something tangible you can hold on to. Well, Jesus is the right person to, to ask. He can handle your doubt. I'm reminded by uh, 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 the news, the pronouncement to Sarah in Genesis. This is a sidebar. You remember in Genesis when the angel came and said, you're going to have a baby? She was almost 100 years old, Andre. And the angel of God came to Sarah and said, you're going to have a baby. What did she do? She laughed. Ha! 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 Me? Ha! Baby? Right. Jesus is the right person. He can handle your doubt. Jesus can handle it. See, and that's the thing I want to encourage us all to do is to don't confine your thoughts of God to some limitations on what you can understand. He can handle anything you bring to him. He can show up in your life. The Lord is not deterred by locked doors. He comes in this room and says peace to them in a, in a room that, was, that, that had no doors that was open. He just shows up. Don't think he can't get access to you, child of God. The Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Therefore, it is our responsibility to overcome faithlessness. It's required of us to put aside our reluctance and to believe and open the door. Two lawyers in England. And the great triumph of deism, deism is the belief that everything is God, this pulpit is God, these flowers are God, that this microphone is God, this book is God, you're God. Deism is the belief that everything is God. But in the great triumph of deism in England, two of the most brilliant men in the, in the denial of the supernatural were eminent legal authorities, Gilbert West and Lord Littleton. The two men were put forward to crush the defenders of the supernatural in the Bible. They had a conference together. And one of them said to the other that it would be difficult to maintain their position unless they disposed of two of the alleged bulwarks of Christianity. Who? Saul of Tarsus and Jesus the Christ. They made it their goal in life to discredit that Saul was converted to Paul and that Jesus was the Messiah. Littleton undertook to write a book to show that Saul of Tarsus was never converted and is recorded as is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, but that his alleged conversion was a myth. Littleton was to write the other book alleging that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was a myth. West said to Littleton, I shall have to depend upon you for my facts, for I'm somewhat rusty on the Bible. 
To which Littleton replied that he was counting upon West, for he too was somewhat rusty on the Bible. And one of them said to the other, well, if, if, we're, if we're to be honest in the matter, we, we ought to at least study the evidence. And this is what they did. They had numerous conferences together. They met together. They talked together. They worked together. They were preparing their works. And in one of these conferences, West said to Littleton that there had been something on his mind for some time that he had thought to speak to him about, that as he had been studying the evidence, he was beginning to feel that there was something in it. Littleton replied that he was glad to hear him say so, for he himself had been somewhat shaken as he had studied the evidence of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Finally, when the books were finished, the two men met. West said to Littleton, have you written your book? Replied that he had, but he said, West, I have been studying the evidence and weighing it according to the recognized laws of legal evidence. And I become satisfied that Saul of Tarsus was converted, as is stated in the Acts of the Apostles, and that Christianity is true. And I have written my book on that side. The book can be found today in any first class library. Have you written your book, said Littleton? Yes, but I, as I have studied the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and have waited according to the acknowledged laws of evidence, I have become satisfied that Jesus really rose from the dead as recorded in the Gospels. You can't mess with this book, Saint. You cannot mess with this book. You could be Lee Strobel, an atheist writing for the Chicago Sun-Times. You could be C.S. Lewis, an atheist who did not want to touch the word of God. But you can't mess with this book and not be converted. You can't mess with it. Don't play with it. You can't interact with his word. You can't come around his people. You can't pray to God on a regular basis and not have your faith overcome its hang-ups. Jesus is alive and the verdict is in, or as Maury would say, the results are in. With regard to the resurrection of Jesus and the claims of the gospel witness, they are credible. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead and he's physically alive and well. There's a couple of things I want you to know from this text and to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is alive and well. Number one is this, relinquish your reluctance, let it go. Put your doubt to bed, put it to rest. Number two, allow your faith to overcome its limitations. I didn't say get rid of them, but your faith can overcome them. Here's the third thing I want you to know and I'll be seated. Respond with a personal confession of faith. Look at verse 28. Thomas said, he put his hand in his thing in his he put his fingers in his hand and his hand in his side, and he said, My Lord and my God. And you release your lungs. Believe that Jesus is alive. And you move your faith beyond to reach it beyond its limits. When you realize the gracious condensation condescension of the resurrected one who will not be hindered or put off by human demands, you will find yourself with a wonderful confession. I love what Thomas says here because though he gets what he asked for and cries out my Lord and my God, I hear his words in a completely different fashion. For I hear Thomas saying, my Lord, my God, he's made a believer out of me. I don't know who or what it will take for you to cry out like this, but if you're going to see God face to face one day, you're going to have to confess your belief in him. For some time, it takes some, for some people, it takes a lifetime. For others, it doesn't take too much. For me, it took a fight at Morehouse College followed by a flight back to Chicago. Whatever it is that God needs to do to prove himself to you, he can orchestrate the, necess the necessary evidence. He can arrange the variables. He can manipulate your schedule. <laughs> he can get you to cry out a confession toward him in faith. And he does so because he's God. And no sustained interaction with the Lord Jesus will cause you to walk away with doubt. 
This Thomas episode is a gift to modern cynics. It allows one to evaluate all the evidence about Jesus and move from suspicion to faith. We're quick to cry out at the top of our lungs our allegiance to the Bears, our allegiance to our college team, our allegiance to our family, our allegiance to, you know, anything that's out there. However, none of our alliances will prove, will provide us with access to glory. But allegiance to Jesus will. None of uh, none will ensure that we will make it to heaven, but Jesus will. I said allegiance to Jesus with a personal confession will ensure that we ain't serving God because it's cute or something other than what God wants us to get out of it. No, we respond to the work of Jesus when we view his nail-scarred hands and his side and his feet. Jesus made a believer out of me. I'm done. Let me get this last point and I'll sit down. Realize the value of your response. Verse 29. Because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have seen and yet have, have not seen and yet have believed. He says something, and if you read too fast, you might miss it. He says, Thomas, I'm going to say it like to you. He said, bro, you, it took all of that for you to believe me. For real? It, it took all of that? It, you needed all of that just to believe me? Really? That blew your mind? Well, allow me to take this opportunity to relay an even better way to respond in faith. I have had a long log of ambition in teaching a book of John, and I thank God for it. But as one rabbi said, the proselyte is dearer to God than all the Israelites who stood by Mount Sinai. For if all the Israelites had not seen the thunder and the flames and the lightning and the quaking mountain and the sound of the trumpet, they would not accept the law and taken upon themselves the kingdom of God. Yet this man has seen none of these things and yet comes and gives himself to God and takes upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of God. Is there anyone dearer than this man? It is not true religion that later generations of Christians who have seen neither the empty tomb nor the risen Christ are of a lower order. Jesus himself pronounces them blessed. You've got to know that you've sit in a privileged position, saint. We weren't physically there when he turned water to wine. We weren't there when he healed the official son. We weren't there when he healed a man sick of 38 years, when he fed 5,000, when he gave sight to the blind, when he raised a dead Lazarus, when he, we weren't there when he was led down the Via Dolorosa. We weren't there when they tried him for blasphemy. We weren't there. We weren't there when they accused him of treason. But it matters little now, for he has declared that we're better off anyway. He says, Thomas, if you place in your finger here, blew you away. How much more for those who haven't seen what you've seen? How much more for you, child of God, who believe in spite of the distance and time between us and this true story? First Peter 1, 8, 9 says it best. Since you... Though you don't see him, you love him. Jesus takes notice of people who put their trust in him apart from the miraculous. But if you need more proof, here's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We're going to now take some time to receive the Lord's Supper. But before we do so, I'd like for you to turn in your songs of Zion and sing a couple of verses of Were You There? We sang this the other day. And as we're singing, we'll be preparing. The Donald will come down and he'll be the one to administer the elements today. But we're going to receive the Lord's Supper on this resurrection morning. And as we do, we're going to sing this song. And we're going to position ourselves in that place. More than that, we're going to Imagine, if you will, the empty tomb. We're going to proclaim my Lord and my God, as Thomas did, on this side of Calvary. Verse 126. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord. Oh, 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 sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, 
tremble Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Verse 2 Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side, in the side? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. seen this last verse I want you to invite yourself like those women the first gospel preachers who rushed to the tomb that morning and sing this song as though you are eyewitness yourself and let's sing this last verse to the glory of God ready were you there when they laid him in the tomb were you To tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? We got one more verse. I'm gonna make this up myself. Were you there when he got up out the grave? Were you there when he got up out the grave? Were you there? Were you there when he got up out the grave? Hallelujah, were you there? Whoa, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Shout, to shout, hallelujah, to tremble. Were you there? When he got up out the grave. Hallelujah. We come to this table again. We come to this table on, the resur on resurrection morning. Rejoicing. Full of joy. <laughs> At the finished work of Calvary. He completed the mission of God. He did it. And your life is better for it today. The text in scripture records that night he was betrayed and set in motion the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 
The text in John talks about him uh, in a night of relinquishing, giving instructions to his disciples. 14 through 17 contains the whole night, one chapter or several chapters, one conversation. And in those chapters, Jesus begins to distribute the elements after praying over them, he distributes them to his disciples and gives them meaning. We're going to take a few moments right now before we receive these elements to ask God for forgiveness, cleansing, that we might receive these elements with the right spirit. And I'm going to ask Mac, after a few moments of silence, as we do business with God, you do business with God on your own. And you who are watching, do business with God on your own. Um, forget, uh, forgive me for not inviting you to go grab some elements from your cupboard. But go grab some elements from your cupboard and join us back here right now to receive the Lord's Supper. And then after a few moments of silence, Reverend Mac is going to ask a prayer of cleansing and forgiveness. Jesus, we come before you as holy, <clears throat> and we worship, adore you, but seeing your holiness, your righteousness, and your mercy on us, we ask you to forgive our sin. We ask you to forgive the shallowness of our faith when we're tested so many times short and we ask you today one more time to forgive us stepping into a stronger position of trust because you have touched us today so <clears throat> we're ready now to remember what you have done and to touch you through these elements in a way just actively remembering your presence now because of what you did then. In Jesus' name, amen. On that fateful night when Jesus was betrayed with his disciples flanking him, he took, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this bread represents my body which will which would be broken for them which is broken for you shall we receive the lord's body the lord's broken shall we remember the lord and his broken body in this way together while they were still reclining while they were still at the table, he took the cup, one cup, communal cup, passed it around to each of them. He said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. It represents the shed blood of Jesus at Calvary for the remission of all our sins. Shall we remember our Messiah? Shall we remember what he did that Friday evening? In order to redeem each of us, let us remember together in this way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I almost feel like singing one of those shouts. Uh, he's alive. He's alive. And I know it, and I know it. Jesus died, Jesus died, and he rose again, and he rose. He's alive, he's alive, and I know it. Jesus died, and he rose again. Hallelujah. Let us gather to the gate. <laughs> he got up out the grave, hallelujah. He got up out the grave. 
Won't we gather or stand where you are so that we can sing our doxology and be released from this place together? Wherever you are, and even if you're tuning in, won't you sing our doxology together? Praise God from risen indeed. Go in peace, saints. Enjoy this resurrection day and enjoy it and everything it means to you and me. Believe beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is alive and well. We thank you for tuning in this week. We'll see you next week. We're going to live in this resurrection reality. God bless you. God keep you. We'll see you next time. Amen. Amen.